Welcome back to 1834, chess friends. It's the final of the second match between McDonnell and Le Bourdonnais. McDonnell was winning four games to one, but Le Bourdonnais won the last three games in a row to bring it back to a tie at four all. So will McDonnell be able to bring it over the line, or will Le Bourdonnais snatch the match away from him? Let's find out. We have e4 from McDonnell and c5 from Le Bourdonnais in response. And here, all of the chess friends, past, present, and future, are screaming at McDonnell just don't play f4. You've played this many, many times in these last two matches and you almost always lose. Mr. Walker, who's writing down the moves, uh, sitting next to the board, has got his head in his hands, cringing because he also doesn't want f4. Le Bourdonnais probably placed bets with all his friends in the crowd uh, as to what's going to happen. So, McDonnell takes off his shades and he plays f4. e6, knight to f3, and d5, e5 from McDonnell, knight to c6, and c3, f6, knight to a3, knight to h6, knight back to c2, and bishop, not bishop, queen to b6. So these are all the same moves that we've seen quite a few times before. There's nothing new so far. We have d4, and developing the light square bishop to d7, and now h4 from McDonnell. And here in this position, the last time we saw it was in game seven, where Le Bourdonnais played the C pawn captures D4 and then knight F5. But here he immediately castles queenside. So something different going on now, a slightly different move order. Let's see how this develops. We have A3 from McDonnell. He wants to immediately start pushing his pawns towards the queenside castle king. The king tucks himself away a bit more tidily on B8 and we have b4, continuing the plan, as I mentioned, pushing the pawn on the queen side towards the king. And now we have c captures d4. c captures d4 and now knight f5. Um, we've seen previously uh, with this opening, McDonald likes to send his king over here and will try to tuck it in behind this pawn. He thinks that it might be safe over here. But usually we have the bishops coming in here and attacking the king before he does so. However, here he goes for king to f2 straight away. And we have h5 from Le Bourdonnais. Now bishop to d3, knight to h6, tucking in behind the h-pawn. And Morphy, commenting in 1859, wants to say something. He says, had black captured the d-pawn with the queen's knight, white would, re would have replied, knight captures knight, followed by bishop to e3, winning a piece. Okay, Morphy, so how does that work? Well, if the knight captures back, then the bishop pins the knight against the queen. So he's going to lose his knight or the queen. So very interesting, Morphy. Thank you very much. Um, that wasn't played, which is good for Le Bourdonnais. He played knight to h6, as we said. And the game continues with bishop to d2, knight to g4 with check. So the king moves out of the way by advancing to g3. And now rook to c8, looking down the nice open file here, and McDonald plays queen to e2. So now his rooks uh, can see each other. He's kind of fully developed now, except he's not really castled, unless you want to call this McDonald castling, this uh, weird setup that he always has with this opening. Bishop to e7, and now Le Bourdonnais' rooks can see each other. He is fully developed, except that his king is properly castled, unlike McDonald's. But McDonald has a plan. He's going to keep pushing these queenside pawns. He plays a4. And Le Bourdonnais decides to activate a very similar plan. He pushes g5 towards the white king. McDonald keeps going. a5 attacks the queen, and the queen backs off. And he keeps going. b5 attacking the knight. So Le Bourdonnais is going to have to deal with this. But from this point, things are going to get very messy, so hold on to your hats. Le Bourdonnais ignores this. He captures the pawn on f, which comes with check. So the king moves out of the way. And now he still has to deal with this threat on the knight. And he decides to give away his knight by capturing the pawn on d4 and wrecking McDonald's center. So will this uh, sacrifice of his knight be in vain or will it lead to something? McDonald captures back with his c knight. And now Le Bourdonnais captures the e pawn, again threatening this knight. And what does McDonald do? Well, he ignores this. He is a knight up at the moment, remember? He just pushes his b pawn and threatens the queen once more. The queen moves out of the way to d6. 
Now here, the engine says that McDonnell is completely winning. He should just push the pawn to a6 and he will remain up the exchange. So for example, the a pawn captures, the a pawn captures, the king captures, and now the bishop comes to a6 with check, backed up by the queen and the rook. The king moves out of the way and the bishop captures the rook. Uh, so very nice for McDonnell. And as well as this, Morphy has a comment. He says, rook on h to b1 has been has justly been pronounced white's best player at this juncture the move is fruitful of interesting variations and would we think have left the advantage with the first player uh, okay morphy he doesn't elaborate though he is being lazy as usual but nonetheless maybe that was fine however mcdonald didn't play either of those nice moves instead he played the knight on f captures e5 and the game is drawing again. So bad luck, McDonald. You missed your chance, but maybe you'll get another one. We'll find out. The queen captures the knight, and now the queen captures the queen. The knight captures the white queen, and the white bishop here captures the pawn on f4, which also pins the knight. So this bishop comes to d6 to help defend it. Now, after all of that, you can see that McDonald has given back the piece that he was up. They now both have two bishops and one knight each, and two rooks each. But Le Bourdonnais has five pawns to McDonald's four, so not looking that good for McDonald from this point. Uh, well, maybe he has something up his sleeve. We hope so. We'll continue. Bishop to b5, attacking this bishop. Um, this white bishop's defended by this knight, and this knight is defending the black bishop. So everything's sort of attacking and defending each other. But if it was to remain like this, McDonald would win the exchange. If he captured this bishop, the uh, the knight would need to capture it back, which would reveal an attack on this other bishop. So McDonnell would capture an extra bishop if this played out. But Le Bourdonnais doesn't want to calculate all of that straight away. He just plays rook to c3, delivering a check and delaying the situation in the middle of the board here. McDonnell blocks with g3. And now Le Bourdonnais avoids the situation by playing bishop back to c8. And we continue with pawn captures on a7, delivering a check. And Le Bourdonnais doesn't capture back with the king. He thinks it's safer to bring his king straight into the corner and leave it there. McDonald pushes his a pawn now, trying to put as much pressure as he can on the black king in the corner. And here Morphy comments, he says, Black should at once retreat his knight to f7 and must then win through the strength of his past center pawns. So sounding very ominous for McDonald from that perspective, but very nice for Le Bourdonnais. Uh, however, Le Bourdonnais did not play knight to f7. Instead, he captured with the pawn on the a-file. So let's see how this falls out. We have the bishop capturing the pawn here, and now Le Bourdonnais does play knight to f7, a move later than Morphy would have liked. And we have bishop captures bishop, knight captures bishop, bishop captures bishop on c8, and rook on h captures the bishop on c8. And after that, capture fest you can see that mcdonald has won his pawn back so it's even on the number of pawns on the board they've got a knight each and two rooks each however le Bourdonnais' king is now looking much more precarious than mcdonald's king who is nicely tucked away behind these pawns so let's see how the game continues knight captures on e6 and suddenly mcdonald is winning by one pawn let's hope that he can maintain this lead he still has to deal with this dangerous past central pawn but perhaps his own past pawn on the seventh rank is even more dangerous it's uh, certainly keeping the black king busy in the corner here so what does Bourdonnais do he plays knight to e4 of course threatening the g pawn here so mcdonald moves to defend it and Bourdonnais goes for a check with knight f2 now here morphy says Rook to c2 was the correct play. And again, Morphy doesn't elaborate here. He is incorrigibly lazy after all. But this time it's the last straw and he promptly gets fired from his job writing for the ledger. So goodbye, Mr. Morphy. Luckily, I have arranged a replacement for him, a guest commentator, somebody with a temperament, a temperament similar to my own, a Mr. Jack Hackett. So welcome, Mr. Jack Hackett. I'm sure you'll do a good job. So rook to c2 wasn't played. Let's wind it back. We had, of course, knight to f2 with check. So McDonald plays his king out of the way, down to g2, and the knight comes up to g4. Uh, a nice little outpost for it. We have rook on g to b1 along this nice open file, looking to cause the black king even more trouble in its corner. 
Le Bourdonnais plays rook to c2, which comes with check. So the king comes back to g1, and we have knight to e5. And MacDonald brings his rook to a3, adding some protection for this backwards uh, pawn on the g file. And here Le Bourdonnais decides to go for a rook exchange. Rook to c1 with check, and the exchange of rooks here is forced, and ends with another check, so king to g2. The rook checks again on c2, and Le Bourdonnais starts heading towards the rook. Uh, it, won't be able to stop him advancing like this if it continues to check. So Le Bourdonnais decides he needs a different plan and brings his rook back to c6, threatening the knight. The knight comes back to f4, and this is threatening both pawns, so not looking good for Le Bourdonnais. Uh, he pushes the d pawn. He needs to really make this pawn count. It's the last hope that he appears to have. And we have uh, e2 from the king, and the rook comes down to check once more. King to d1, continuing to zigzag across to the center of the board and beyond. And we have rook back to c4, adding a protector to this pawn. So, of course, this pawn on the wing is undefended, and he's winning by two whole pawns now. So fantastic stuff. We have knight to g4, knight to f4, knight to e3 with check. The knight's defended by the pawn, so the rook doesn't want to capture it. Uh, the king just moves to e2, and now the knight comes back to f5, which threatens the pawn although it is defended by the rook, so I'm not sure what Le Bourdonnais is thinking here. Maybe he's just run out of good ideas. Let's hope so. We have knight to d5, and indeed Le Bourdonnais just captures the pawn, and instead of just capturing it back with the rook, MacDonald plays his king to f3. Le Bourdonnais goes rook to c6, and MacDonald just picks up the knight here, and at this point, Le Bourdonnais resigned this ninth game of the second match and also resigned the second match itself. So he's done it. Let's give him a crown. Awesome stuff. I'm sure Le Bourdonnais had a swearing fit and stormed off while McDonald, for once, decided to have a few drinks and a few wagers, maybe even a few cigars with his British friends in the Westminster Chess Club. So awesome stuff. Second match to McDonnell, the first match to Le Bourdonnais, so it's 1-1 in matches. Now, just as a, to wrap up this second match, I'm going to bring you back to my book here uh, in the chapter called The Battles of McDonnell and Le Bourdonnais, and this is the summary of the second match. It says, McDonnell commenced the first game of the second match by playing boldly the Evans Gambit. It was new to Della Bourdonnais, and our countryman won the game. The French champion told me that he here purposely declined playing again for two or three days, during which time he sedulously analysed the novel debut and made up his mind upon its merits, both as to its strengths and weakness. Della Bourdonnais was not a man to be caught tripping twice. His great success in the first match made him perhaps play with less energy in the second, which was won by MacDonald, 5-4 to four and no draws. The British player naturally gained in confidence from this very honourable result, and the third match was looked forward to by the friends of the parties with renewed interest. So you can see from this that there is going to be a third match, so join me again next time as we continue.